welcome to the stage. Emma? Hello. Um, if you want to turn your cameras on and you're still with us, please do so. We'd love to see your faces. Welcome back to the room. Um, and yeah, we're delighted to be here in the, in the studio uh, with these wonderful beings. What would you call them? Uh, we call them creatures, um, even though the, this is um, part of a piece that's called Coral Avenue because they move so much and they have expression. We go for creatures, even though I guess you might, you might technically call them plants. Um, yeah, this is a quarter of a larger scale piece. So the full piece is eight of these that are usually arranged in an avenue formation. Um, but only space for two in here today. <laughs> so we can see that they're inflatable. Um, how, how do you get them moving around? Whilst, do you, are you controlling air? Are there strings pulling things inside? Or? So they are almost completely just fabric and air. There's no strings and no, no rigid components at all, apart from some valves, maybe about this big inside. Um, each of these is made from two separate chambers that run the full length. Um, and there are valves that let air into each chamber and a valve that lets air out of each chamber. And the balance of volume and pressures between the two chambers um, are what makes it move and switch between its positions. Yeah. And I'm sure you'll see these at exhibitions and festivals uh, over the next year or so. You've got lots yeah. of things planned. Yeah, we really hope so. Um, we have some bookings um, that you will be able to find out about if you join our mailing list. So we're showing at a light festival in the East Midlands and at Worcester Light Festival in the coming weeks. Um, and we have some new work that is doing UK touring later this spring and summer and hopefully international touring later this year as well. Um, I guess yeah, follow, we've lots of new work coming up. We're busy. It's yeah. exciting. Follow Air Giants HQ on Twitter and social media and everything, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. They look. They look so soft and like I want to hug them. Yeah. They, well, I they mean, they're really they're super safe to touch. Um, and we've had all sorts of interactions with these. We find that um, kids are really grabby and cuddly. They like to go straight in. No holds barred. Um, and adults tend to be a bit more tentative, but do get right up in there. And um, yeah, we've had a full few hugs, a few um, punching, a few <laughs> punching events, obviously. Um, but they're, they're robust, they'll withstand that. Um, all of the delicate stuff lives inside. And um, I think that's something we never really picked up on. When we were developing the work, we were very excited that it was um, inflatable, partly because you could pack it away so small and transport it really easily and set these up. So we set these up in, I don't know, 10, ten minutes maybe. They just come out of the car and plug in. Um, but what people have really found exciting about them is that they are safe. Um, so we, we knew that as we were developing them, but um, people who are putting up work and installing work in a robotic context are really pleased that they don't have to have safety barriers. There's no safety equipment involved. People don't need briefing to go up and, and meet them. I mean, you, you really can just, um, I mean, they're, they're not going to hurt you. They're completely, they're completely friendly and safe. <laughs> do, they, do they have emotions? <laughs> Are they going to be offended if you're going up and pulling them around? Yeah. I don't know. No, I don't think so. Um, they, they do like attention and they, they um, have some range-finding sensors in them. So they are aware if you're close to them, how close you are, if there are a few of you and how long you stay, and their level of excitement and enthusiasm will shift accordingly around that. And this piece of work, um, in this piece of work, each creature is also aware of who's near its, its neighbor. So when you're in the full avenue, as you walk through, um, the first one will respond to you, but you'll see that effect down the whole of the piece of work. Um, it's, it's harder to see that when there's two, but it's clearer when all eight are installed. That adds to that whole sort of organic sort of feel of it when they're all connected and all reacting as a whole. Yeah, yeah. So uh, we made a piece of work 
In fact, let's start at the beginning. We, we founded back in April 2020, and that was off the back of some amazing prototype funding we got from um, the Southwest Creative Technology Network. And that was to help develop um, creative technology businesses in the southwest of England. And that funding really allowed us to cement some of the early research um, my colleague Robert had done, uh, Richard, sorry, in, um, in inflatable structures and morphing inflatable shapes. And what came out of that prototype, prototype period was a huge... Um, like we've got a huge library of different ways to make things move for fabric and air and how to control them with robotics inside. Um, but also a very, very large, so 10 meter long giant snail um, that has been touring the country this last winter season. Oh, I think we've got a video of that. I'll just pop it <laughs> yeah. on, the, on the screen. If you, if you could, that'd be great. So it. she's called Luma. And um, Luma was our first proof of concept, really, that people are just really attracted to these things. So what drew us to using soft robotics and inflatables in this way is that it allows you to be really um, biomorphic and bio-inspired because it is so inherently flexible and it moves across the whole structure rather than being your classic um, ball and stick joint that you get in rigid robotics. There's um, a much wider palette of motion we can create and we believed that people would have instinctive emotional reactions to them and it would be able to make people have almost akin to the experience of meeting a very large creature like an elephant or or something that is just so unEveryday. and um, that's really what we saw when we took Luma out um, from kids and adults alike so this this piece is a progression of the work to see if we can create more of um, an environment and create an idea of a feeling of that intelligence spreading from one piece to the next rather than um, a single creature in isolation. So the best kind of theme park. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you, you go to like museums and they've got animatronic dinosaurs and things like that, but they, they feel really stale and not very alive, whereas these have so much life in them. It's exciting when you parents you see parents go, oh, um, my kids can just run up and touch it, and you see the relief as they just go, oh, okay, great. And um, yeah, as a parent myself, I, I celebrate that. So you don't, <laughs> yeah, there's no precious... There's no preciousness required, and um, sometimes we've had kids so excited around Luma that it has been frenzy. <laughs> we, we hoped to inspire lots of emotion. Like we thought we'd get like, sensitive interactions and really meaningful moments, and we absolutely did. But we also have got full-on frenzy, um, which I'm going to count as a win. <laughs> it can make people feel that. You must be onto something good. <laughs> I definitely feel scared when it yeah. suddenly falls on me, <laughs> goes to grab me. Um, yeah. Katie, have you got any, any uh, questions? And... Yeah, hi, Emma. Hi, yeah. Did not to be there. Um, I was wondering if you could tell us a bit about your team, because I'm quite interested in that you've got very mixed range of skills and backgrounds. Yeah, absolutely. We, yeah, I feel in incredibly lucky to work with my team, really. And again, I have to celebrate the initial funding that um, that spotted that it had potential, really, because our pitch was um, uh, interesting, really. But after we, we pitched and we presented the idea, it was like, we want to make huge, giant, inflatable bug robots, and people are going to love them, and we had very little to, to kind of offer in, in way to evidence that. But I think it was the strength of our team that gave it credibility, really. So um, there are three directors with the core members, and it's myself um, and my colleagues Robert and Richard. And um, my background is actually not in technology at all, um, so it's in theatre design. I spent 10 years designing for theatre and with a specific focus on puppetry, so design for puppets for TV and for stage and film. And it's really interesting and delightful how transferable those skills have been 
um, into this. And that's not just the fabrication, but really thinking about um, how things move, how the eye reads that, um, what you can change to give it the greatest impact. Um, so I am the creative director, and we, we all chip in with our, the best of our different backgrounds. So Robert and Richard both have good software design experience. Um, Richard has worked for multiple startups in the past writing, um, writing software for apps and things like that. But alongside that has been a real champion of the hacking community, helping people get things made, um, just taking delight in the wonderful things people do off their own bat. Um, and that's how we met, really, because he's been always been so um, up for sharing, up for facilitating, putting on exhibitions. So I think I met Richard nearly, I want to say nearly 15 years ago, at a pop-up exhibition in Stugs Croft, where he was showing off um, some drawing robots he'd made. And they, they drew portraits of people passes by, and that's exactly the sort of thing I like. So that's where I first met him. And we ended up working together professionally um, with a company called Rusty Squid, who were a creative robotics company based in Bristol. And we were working on a, social, a socially engaged robot for a Channel 4 program that just got abandoned on the streets of Bristol. And its, aim, its job was to get people to pick it up and interact with it. So that's where I first got to apply my puppetry design skills to robotics. And Richard bought his amazing tinkering, fabricating, software design, hardware design background. Um, and our third colleague is Robert. And he also has a, a software design background. But he works at Bristol Robotics Laboratory as well, at Bristol Uni. Um, and also has an incredibly broad making experience. So I think between us, there isn't much that we can't fabricate. And it's been amazing to have that mix of skills. Um, and for me personally, it's been amazing to be able to run a robotics company without having had an, a very rigid technical background. And there's a lot that goes into running the company that isn't, doesn't require a degree in computer science. And that's really nice to know and something that um, wasn't obvious to me when we started the process. So I'm pleased it's worked out. Shall we, um, we can take the camera off, have a bit of a yeah, close-up look at some fun. of these robots. Let's, uh, let's see if the technology works. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit Blair Witch. So you go, go so far. So that, this is the, the box of tricks. So you see, you might be able to see the range finders that are built in down here. And they go through different moods. So um, <laughs> I think this one may, have, may be having a little sleep. <laughs> <laughs> but this, uh, either they'll either come towards you when they triggers you trigger the range finders, or if you stay too long or you get too close, it may lean away and uh, have, a, have a little shy moment. Um, we had to do quite a lot of calibration so that um, they move gently enough that they're not dangerous to people and they're not knocking people over. Um, but in terms of how, um, how safe and... Um, I don't want to know what the word is. You can really, in, you can really interrogate them. Like, if they do get you, it doesn't hurt. It doesn't hurt, or you can squash yourself right in there. And this, this can just lead to incredibly unexpected interactions. Um, they'd not, you don't use them in the way you would use traditional robotics at all. Um, if you um, come around the side, you might be able to see it might be clearer This is about here. as far as we can get. <laughs> oh, OK. You, might, you can see here the two different chambers. So there's one chamber that runs the full length of this here. And the opposing one is on this side. 
And this is one of the strategies we use to make things move. Um, but we, like I said, we have a whole cookbook of different ways to get structures like this to move. We also have to think about how they resist wind and how they cope in the elements, because a lot of the work is outdoor install. Um, and yeah, we, it's, it's been quite it's been quite an amazing year. We have. We're pretty sure that no one is making robots like this, at least not at this scale. Um, it's, um, yeah, the, cent the center scale is amazing. Yeah, so soft robotics is, is, a, is a discipline in its own right. It's having, there's amazing strides being made in it, but it tends to be within um, university laboratories and it tends to be a desktop size and the demos they make tend to be, you know, the, holdable in your hand, very small scale, and made of quite different materials, made of flexible materials, air up quite high pressure. Um, I, I haven't seen any work of this scale that's using those principles in the same way. And um, we've patented some of the structures that we have developed and put in place, which is a really, really exciting place to be in, and um, not something I could have, have imagined last year, really. Katie, have you got more questions lined up? Well, I um, I thought I, I should stop talking at um, in in time for other people to ask questions, but I could definitely ask more if, if no one speaks. So, can well, we if, open if, it up well, to the floor? Yeah, if anyone from the from the audience has any questions, please feel free to type away in the chat because uh, it's, it's quite hard for us to hear over the noise of the fans. But that that is a that is a question. Like, obviously, fans sucking up air, blowing air into them. Are they affected by wind and things? So some, so strong wind would, can push them over, but it's a surprising amount of wind you need to do that. These resist the wind quite well. Um, yeah, they. You have to just think about where you pitch them in relation to wind <laughs> direction, but usually it's fine. Because <laughs> I saw a picture. I think they were sort of on a rooftop. And yeah, they, they were happy, very happy on that day. Are there any um, plans to make them more intelligent or react to their surroundings um, for other ways? So you've got the distance sensors. Are there other things that you're looking at? Um, we're developing a, a piece of work at the moment that will be shown at a few festivals later this year. And it is using very similar principles, but a much bigger scale. So it's a whole garden. And there'll be nine very large interactive plants, archways and some vines and ferns, and we will be using different sensors to track audiences through that space. Um, but we are mostly focusing on on um, like positional sensors at the moment, so just better ways of tracking audiences, better ways of following where people are. Um, but we are also working on an academic research project with some researchers at the University of Bristol in their soft robotics department. And that's interesting because it's taking these principles but at a, at a smaller scale and we're looking at ways of developing um, assisted communication aids for um, people with communication difficulties, thinking about if there's a way of offering some sort of um, body language alternative for people who aren't able to do that by themselves. Um, the uh, current assisted communication devices are very um, direct, very um, simple and needs-based. Like, I need a cup of tea or I need this. And we are looking to see if there's ways of being able to show attention, show direction of attention, um, and show moods through like, an invisible body embodiment yeah. for people okay. that can't. And through that, we'll be using, we'll be at least considering loads of different sensing options. Because, mm. yeah, like you said, the these these are definitely very analog. They're not digital. They are yeah. they they have a whole range of like values that they can they can project to the world. So yeah, not just yes, I'm going to do this thing or I'm not doing this thing. They, no, and I guess the other thing about them is that interpretation will always be open, right? It's not they're not robots that will pick up something from point A and lift it exactly over to point B, and that isn't their function. And we can try and get them to impart a 
a mood or emotion or feeling someone, but it will always be open for interpretation because of their inherent squiggliness. <laughs> <laughs> that needs to go on the website, Air Giants. Inherently squiggly. <laughs> inherently squiggly. Could be a good strap line. <laughs> yeah. uh, okay, so there's some, there's some questions here. Um, do you make them available for private events or only public occasions and venues? Yeah, I think we would. I think we would absolutely make them available for private events. So, we are we're in a, a great position as a company in that we have um, lots of projects coming up in the next few months, and for the first time, we are too busy to handle it ourselves. So, we have recently started working with a producer to help um, take on that the load of organising the events and the public event bookings that are coming in, but we, we have definitely thought that private events could be something we could consider to help sustain us and help through private events being able to then have more time for the R&D of the, the exciting things to keep pushing us forward. So absolutely, none of us are producers, apart from our new producer who is a producer who's going to help <laughs> us with that. <laughs> Katie asked, um, when you talked about the tracking aspect of it, like yeah. going in the arch, is that purely so that the uh, robotics can respond there and then in the moment, or are you sort of collating that data then and using for analysis later on? We are not collating it yet, um, partly for data consent reasons and the problem with storing data, but partly because we, we're just not ready to do that yet. I think if we can just capture like in the moment, here and now data that tells us how to respond, then we have like the framework in place, so we, that, then we can start extracting and collecting. But I think if we could, were collecting now, we'd in a, be in that position where we had like all this data that we just had to keep and no proper time to analyze it or interrogate <laughs> it. But it is something we've thought of for the future. Yeah, collecting data, analyzing it, it's a whole yeah. other ball game. So even if you wanted to do things like uh, take a <laughs> look at someone, work out. Um, if they are an adult or a child and you want the robot to react differently, yeah. then you still have to do all the data processing agreements and stuff for that. Uh, yeah. Because you don't want your data being sent off to America and then back again to, for you to do that analysis. So. Yes, yeah, you have to be really careful. But another thing that's interesting, and I hadn't, I hadn't fully appreciated the technical challenge of, is um, how crappy sensing can be, if you excuse my language. Like, you really notice it when the snail Luma has a mode where she can be remotely steered. So sometimes it's one of us off, off site somewhere or just not being able to be seen, just steering and giving her precise control and motion. And when someone stands in your way, <laughs> you're like, oh my God, I can't see anything. <laughs> and you suddenly realize like, what happens if a sensor fails. Like it, and you also realize how, what an amazing set, what sensors we are. Like I, I gauge your height, your size, your distance from me. I gauge how loud you are, I gauge where you are in this space. Um, all these things. And you need such a suite of sensors to be able to do that. So we have to be quite selective about what we use and where and what we really need to make it work. Um, yeah. But that, it's been a bit of a shock. What I really want is just <laughs> a cheap, um, reliable, all singing, all dancing sensor. <laughs> um, that, that's been a big challenge. So jo Joanne asks, it seems like these two have different personalities. Are they running the same software on them? And um, they're just choosing their personality at one time? They are, um, but they do just cycle around different moods. So they, they have like downtime and uptime, if you like. Um, and they, they will just do that. That looks like nap time to this me. This is very downtime, <laughs> yeah. Um, but they should, they should be aware of what, what the other are doing. So I would like to say that if someone goes and triggers that one, the other one should wake up. Like. Um, yeah, Rose says that uh, we've created hanged signal recognition, which works on, on the edge, so no data is collected in the cloud. Oh, that's okay. brilliant. So, yeah, so hand gesture recognition. Yeah, that would be, would be great. Cool. Yeah. Um, so yeah, clearly in, in COVID times, mm -hmm. having things where you don't need physical uh, t you don't need to touch things and interact with them that way. You can do it um, with sensors and just be hands off. Yeah. 
although these do really want you to be hands on. <laughs> but one thing we'd really like to have, like touch sensing, like capacitive sense in it, because that would be incredible. Um, but it, that's just a, apart from anything, it's a physical design challenge that means you have to have some sort of wires running up the skin of it. But I mean, it's entirely possible in theory that it, it should be able to have capacitive sense in the same way that a, a phone screen might. Um, and then imagine the possibilities of control. <laughs> you just imagine a massive inflatable cat where everyone's rubbing the belly and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> um. Maybe any more questions? Have you, Peter Vanderford says, have you ever tried to use them in therapeutic sessions? I guess they're quite loud. So. I haven't, but I would be interested in it. We, I haven't, we'd be interested in it. There is a noise. I don't know how much you pick that up from our microphones. Um, but it's not terrible. When Chris is going to get his microphone close. Um, and we haven't found that it really suggests anyone when we're out and about. It's not like anyone's ever gone, oh no, the noise. Um, no, I would like to use the therapy sessions. I wouldn't know how to go about that. Let us know if you have thoughts. Well, thank you so much for, for coming and showing these wonderful pieces. Uh, I can't wait to see what you've got in store for the future. Thank you, thank you for having us. It's, it's really great to be able to come back here because Collider was one of the first places that supported us right at the beginning, before we were even a thing. Um, so we're very happy to come back with some work. Um, and I guess I could just round off by saying, uh, yeah, please join our mailing list if you're interested in seeing up upcoming dates and work. But also we're generally up for all sorts of collaborations and exciting ideas. So if you do have, if you do have thoughts about work, direction this work could go in, or people we should speak to, please get in contact, because um, we're a friendly bunch. Yeah, this is, it's like the perfect case study of a, an ACT uh, <laughs> expert network for us, a good technology group project. So you've got the collaboration between the artists and the, the technologists, and it's, yeah, it's, it's a, the amazing what you can do when you've got a, such a diverse team, with so much creativity and input. It's, a, it's just, a, it's a real pleasure. It feels, um, yeah, I think that because we founded during pandemic, we were very unsure about the sustainability of, of the idea, really. And we spoke to lots of people through 2020 who all said, this is great, we would love to exhibit your work, we'd love to commission work, and then not being in a position to. And we've had an incredibly busy and challenging and great 2021 where we were actually able to tour and show work for the first time. And we went to 10 different arts festivals last winter and um, had university lovely reaction. And got voted audience's favorite in Lancaster Light Festival, which was a really nice surprise. Um, yeah, it, it's good. It's been a, it's been a long time coming. Excellent. But thank you so much, Emma. Thank you. And thank you to all of our other speakers. Uh, oh, <laughs> I need to plug the camera back in because uh, it's going to run out of battery. We just had a battery warning on our yeah. camera. I'm not sure there we if go. you saw that. <laughs> Fixed. <laughs> Um, yeah, that's the camera saying, yeah, it's time to close now. <laughs> so thank, you, thank you to all of our wonderful speakers uh, presenting on R&D tax credits and grant funding. Uh, thank you as the audience for attending. Um, thank you to our wonderful BSL interpreter, David, and also our host, Collider, uh, and the wider Tech Exeter team, and obviously Air Giants. I'm Katie. Uh, any words? Me? Oh, you've, you've done it. You've said all the thank you so much. Uh, thank you, everyone, again. And um, we hope to, next time, we hope to meet in person. And again, we hope to, we actually hope to be able to do a bit of, I know it's a terrible word, but networking. We do really want to meet people and get people meeting each other because this kind of collaboration that Air Giants came up with is about that meeting of minds. And next time, it'll be in real life. Um, thank you for doing the Zoom version with us. <laughs>